Thanks, thanks. Hello and welcome. Thank you for giving up a cold evening in London to come along and hear about changing the status quo, uh, data and radical transformation at the heart of government. Uh, I'm Alexander Evans. I'm a professor in practice at the LSE. I've been here for just over a year. Uh, and before that, I, I, I was uh, in government, uh, mainly in the Foreign Office, but also in the Cabinet Office and 10 Downing Street. Um, and um, I'm very uh, pleased tonight to be uh, uh, um, chairing our uh, guest speaker, Laura Gilbert. Dr. Laura Gilbert is Director of Data Science in 10 Downing Street. Uh, she's Joint Chief Analyst in the Cabinet Office. And she's had a really interesting career, uh, initially as an academic, uh, then in, uh, in the private sector in a, in a startup. And then, uh, and also a bit of time in, in uh, defence uh, before moving into the centre of government to try and develop and lead a data science capability at the centre of government, but also role model that uh, across government as well. Uh, and she will be speaking in a minute. Just let me um, set out um, how this is going to run. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, her talk will be on the record. But the Q&A session afterwards is off for record, if that's all right. That's to avoid what we call a CEI, a career ending incident. Uh, we've all seen people have those. Now, it's not because Laura's going to have one, because she's not going to have one of those. Uh, but, but the ability of that then allows us to have hopefully a slightly more free flowing conversation uh, in the room. Um, uh, to those of you in the theatre, please put your phones on silent uh, so not to disrupt the event. Um, the event is being recorded and we will make available uh, the recording of the talk as a podcast and as a uh, as a, a video uh, after the uh, event. Um, as usual, there's a chance for you to put questions uh, to uh, Laura um, uh, during the event. For our online, online audience, you can submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, for those of you in your room, um, we'll let you know uh, when we open the floor for questions. And, and please just raise your hand and wait for the stewards with a roving mic to get to you, because there's nothing worse than being silenced when you come out with that um, that bit of wisdom and that profound question that everybody ought to hear. Uh, and we will try and make sure that we get time for questions in the room. Um, just before we start, I wanted to also say that this event celebrates for us uh, uh, what's the first year of uh, one of our newest programs at LSE. Um, that's a master's in public administration in data science for public policy. And a range of our students are in the room here uh, this evening. Uh, we think it's a very exciting part of LSE's uh, continuing evolution of public policy graduate training. Uh, so uh, obviously LSE has been in the business since 1895 of training people, uh, uh, educating people in advance of careers in public life, be that in politics, uh, in bureaucracy and in international organizations or more broadly. For the last 20 years, the LSE has had a master's, a two-year master's in public administration, uh, which has uh, grown from being a very small program to now being a program that encompasses students from uh, dozens of countries. Uh, uh, a few years ago, we started a one-year master's in public policy, uh, which is a, a more executive program for more senior um, uh, individuals with a bit more work experience. And this year we launched um, this MPA in data science for public policy. And the first cohort of 18 students uh, represent uh, our bet on the future of public policy, because the argument really we would have is that tech and data science is going to be key to all forms of life as we go forward, but getting, getting people with the capability, the governance skills, the regulatory policy skills, and the actual technical skills to be able to interrogate, question, uh, commission, uh, and properly engage with data science in government is going to be uh, key. So if you want to learn more about that, please, uh, please look at the um, LSE website. After the um, talk, we will have a drinks reception just outside. Sorry to those online, but you can imagine how good it would be to be here and be part of that. Um, and for X users, the hashtag for today's events is hashtag LSE public policy. Um, so uh, let me now introduce Laura. Come on in. <laughs> Laura, nice. come on in. And just to say, um, so Laura Gilbert is the Director of Data Science in number 10. She's Joint Chief Analyst at the Cabinet Office. Her teams provide fast paced modeling and analysis to support policy making and delivery and rapid prototyping to speed up government innovation. 
And she's also been running a broader transformation agenda, promoting a better use of evidence, data and technology in government policymaking. Uh, crucial, I think, for all governments, uh, crucial too for the British government as we navigate a complex and challenging world. So Laura, the floor is yours. I think you're gonna speak for uh, perhaps 30, 30, 40 minutes and then we're going to open up from there. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. Um, are you having a good evening? Okay, I can already tell you one of the most energetic and engaged audiences <laughs> I've ever spoken to. Um, I'm going to need a teeny tiny bit of audience participation and I don't, I don't want to end up with egg on my face. So I'd like you to do me a favour, please. So we're going to have a practice. I'm going to ask you a question. And what I'd really like you to do is raise your hand in the air and shout yes in response to that question. Okay, please do me a favour, join in. We're going to try this now. Here's the question. Are you looking forward to my talk? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's much better. I really appreciate it. Um, obviously, I'm a data scientist. We do get very excited about big data and predictive analytics and AI. And uh, we like using lots and lots of data to try and learn about the world. But um, data and evidence is a lot more than data science and big data. The data is about evidence, about understanding the way the world works, about how to communicate with people. One of the things I know from data and evidence is one of the very best ways to get someone to do you a favour is by giving them a compliment. What's really interesting about that is that that works very well if, you know, when you're getting the compliment, um, it's from somebody that you like and respect and you believe the compliment is sincere. It also works very well if you don't really like the person and you don't believe the compliment is sincere. You probably didn't believe that you were the most energetic and engaged audience I've spoken to. You knew that wasn't really true, but it still passes as a compliment. And it's going to make it much more likely that you're going to raise your hand in the air and shout when I ask you to. And another thing I know from evidence research, etc., is that when people make a commitment to something, so when you make a choice and when you throw your hand in the air and shout, you're committing to this talk. And when people make a commitment, they believe the thing they've committed to is better than if they hadn't made that choice in the first place. So by persuading you to throw your hands in the air and shout, you will think my talk is better than you would have done otherwise. It's good, isn't it? Um, and that's super manipulative. And I'm sort of using evidence to get you to do what I want, but I think in this case, it's fine because uh, it's a good outcome. It's, it's for the public good. You it will enjoy my talk more, hopefully. You'll think it has a higher value and I'll get an audience that's hopefully a little bit more on my side. So we're all fine. And I come and speak about data and evidence quite a lot. I work in the civil service and fairly often somebody says, we need to upskill the civil servants in data. I know, go and get Laura, she loves a bit of data. And I really do. And as I've been doing these sorts of talks, that's really made me think about why I like it so much. And not everybody enjoys charts and tables and that sort of thing as much as I do. Mm -hmm. But what it really comes down to the reason we need good data and evidence is to make good decisions. And it's one of the most important things that you can do in your entire life, in my opinion, is to learn to make decisions better. And in a job like mine, to learn to help other people to make better decisions. Apparently we make about 35,000 decisions a day, which explains why I'm so tired. So improving the way you can do that, not only sort of impacts the way that you do your job, but it probably impacts the way that you live your life, the way that you choose to raise your children, what you're doing in your spare time, et cetera. It's phenomenally important. Um, I'm gonna focus particularly here on the way that we communicate with data and evidence, because of course in my field, that, that's what I do. Um, and, it, and you know, empowering decision makers to do that well is the main focus of my job. Um, but I'll also talk a little bit at the end about some of the programs we run in quite general terms, and then you can ask for more details in the Q&A. Uh, so, here's a lovely example. This is obviously a joke, right? And I've corrected the grammar because it's offensive. Um, fewer than 5% of ducks have attempted world domination. Pro okay. prob probably true. I mean, you don't have to define what world domination means to a duck. Doubt anyone's ever measured it. But I'm fairly confident. I, I don't feel the need to argue with that statistic. You can already tell immediately it's hugely misleading because it implies that some number that is in some way approaching 
orthodox attempted world domination. And we, we don't think that's a meaningful ceiling, right? There's an inference there, we're going to read it and say, well, in that case, I could probably guess it's maybe 2%, 3% mm -hmm. rather than zero. So that's all very well for a joke, but people use this every so often in anger. So here's an example. This is a political message at the top in the United States. And they've got correct numbers up here. So we've got the number of abortions from 2006 to 2013, and we've got the number of cancer screening and prevention services over the same period. And you can see there's arrows, the lines cross over. They are correctly pointing out that one number goes up and the other goes down. When I look at the numbers themselves on a more realistic axis, you can see that the first one is sort of implying that these two things could be linked in some way. And as I look at the second one, I, I don't think they're linked. The scale is very different. You know, the, the points of inflection don't necessarily you know, relate. Uh, and there's no way you would look at this and think that one of those is causing the other. So taking numbers and misrepresenting the baselines, you can do that in a way that is sort of technically the numbers are right, but it's definitely not correct and appropriate use of data. And so you start to see, you know, how the way we do this and do it ethically start to become very important. And finally, the way people respond to numbers isn't necessarily all that rational. So lovely example of anchoring bias. We've all done this. You go into a shop and there's a jacket and well, maybe it's just me, but there's a jacket and it goes 500 pounds reduced to 150. You go bargain, I must buy the jacket. You didn't necessarily even want the jacket to start with. And I definitely don't have any evidence that it was ever worth 500 pounds. But that is how my brain works when I see numbers. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. And that's how everybody's brain works when they see numbers presented in this way. So the way we're presenting information starts to look very interesting indeed in the topic of research. People are very credulous. I am more credulous than most people, as it turns out. I've got evidence of that. We believe things that have been just broken over and over again. And it's actually part of our evolution. Um, it's a heuristic. It's an example of a shortcut for mental processing. One of the ways that humans make decisions quickly is that we have mental shortcuts. And a very good mental shortcut is to believe what you're told. Most of the time, 60% of people in any one day will tell no lies at all. Most of the time, people will tell you things that they think are true, and believing them is a very good way to get to the answer really quickly. Um, and I actually, I've got, a, I've got an example of this that happened in my life that shows you a little bit about the biology of this situation. And I remember it uh, very frequently, uh, but it's, it's, it sounds a small thing. Quite a long time ago, when I was youngish, so like 15, 20 years ago probably, uh, I read a story about a, a dog attack. And my friend said to me, did you know that Labradors are responsible for most of the dog attacks in the UK. And I said, I did not. Well, a Labrador's actually really violent, and no one's talking about it. I said, that's shocking. My aunt had actually been recently attacked by a Labrador, so, you know, but still it seems really surprising. And when I thought, no, of course it's not that, is it? It's because there's more Labradors. So attacks per capita or per dog or whatever, whatever you're going to call it, um, probably quite low for Labradors, but there's a lot of them. So... Um, so I said to my friend, is it that? Is it that there's just a lot of Labradors? And, we, and my friend said, you know, don't know, actually. So I said, I must look it up. And this must have been quite a long time ago, so I didn't have a phone to hand and immediately Google it. Mm -hmm. So over the years, you know, there would be articles about dog attacks. And I'd say to the person with me, did you know Labradors? And I'd say, you know, I do have to check that because I still haven't confirmed if it's on a per dog basis or just, you know, for the whole thing okay. Uh, given the number of Labradors we have. And eventually I did look it up and I got the answer. And the answer was absolutely rubbish. It's not true at all. However, when I was told that, I anchored it in my brain. I, and there's a reason I did that. I didn't know anything about dog attacks. It was interesting. And it wasn't completely implausible. My aunt had been attacked by a Labrador. So it was just about believable from my understanding. And it stuck in my brain. And it's an actual neurological process. So I've laid down a memory pathway. And now every time somebody says dog attacks me, my brain says Labradors. And I have to remind myself that it's not true. I can't undo that memory pathway. And now neither will you, so enjoy. Um, but I find that a very good reminder for myself and kind of how fragile my brain is when it comes to dealing with absorbing, you know, learning from information. 
it's very easy to anchor to pieces of information that trigger you as interesting. And it's very hard to get rid of them. And you can do that to other people. And you need to be very careful about the way you present information to other people so you don't falsely anchor them. There's something about numbers as well that becomes particularly interesting. So I've anchored to the Labradors. And we also saw this idea earlier where I've anchored to the value of a jacket that's irrelevant. And that can be used by marketing to do me harm effectively. But it gets worse than that. You can use it for lots of things. So here's a horrible, horrible example. Um, it was a study where some journalists went to experienced trial judges. And there it was a case where the sentence was a prison sentence for not that long, one, two years, that sort of thing. And the journalist would go to the judge before sentencing and said, do you think you'll give them a sentence of only three years? And on average, the judges gave the criminals an extra eight months more than if the journalist hadn't answered that question. So just by asking the question, do you think, big number, they'd influence the sentencing decision. That's great if you're negotiating a salary, start big, but very harmful in the wrong hands. So I find this very unsettling personally. The existence of numbers is very confusing to our brains. We need to be very careful with them. And it's not just numbers, it's a bit more broadly about the way we frame problems. Here's an example. Imagine you've got tons of money, and you're gonna buy an investment property. Wouldn't that be lovely? Um, so just, just picture it, picture it now, we're gonna buy an investment property. If I go out and I go to a nice spa, and I talk to some people about homeopathy and I have some aromatherapy candles, and then I go house shopping, I'm very likely to be quite drawn to this lovely house. In fact, I am I'm very drawn to this lovely house. Look at the beautiful climbing roses. It's got thatched roof. You know how expensive that shoes are to maintain? Very. Can't get around through that door. It's a terrible idea for what I want. But if I've been looking at something that is effectively non-rational, I'm quite likely to be very drawn to a non-rational, maybe quite romantic or illogical conclusion when I'm trying to make a decision. Now, that's broken. How about your board? Can we click on here? Don't worry. There we go. There's some very interesting data. And what I'm going to tell us is that you want to make a rational decision, or in my case, if I want other people to make a rational decision, one of the ways that you can do that is instead of showing them bits of aromatherapy, you show them data, any data. So if you are going shopping for a jacket, have a look at a lovely table. Doesn't matter what it's about. If you want your stakeholders, to make a more rational decision, show them some numerical or chart or table, show them some numbers of information like this. This is the XKCB's author's email inbox volume. It is relevant to nothing whatsoever, except possibly a little bit of a commentary on uh, marketing again. Um, if I show somebody this, they are much more likely to make a rational house decision for their investment property. Sure, it's not very pretty. You can get a crown through the door and it's not gonna take a lot of maintenance fantastic and that's actually quite important because what my team does a lot and I will talk briefly about this later but about 80 percent of what we do is literally making dashboards um, that demonstrate predictive models of you know if you make this decision or this combination of decisions we think the future will look like this in terms of dimensions of interest and we might be trying to predict what the you know side effects of decisions are but the very fact we show him a dashboard at all impacts the likelihood that the person looking at it will make a rational, logical and less emotional decision. So the vessel, very important. Maybe it's even more important than the information. I haven't measured it. This is called the framing effect. Decision makers will make inconsistent um, decisions for exactly the same problem based on the way the problem is presented. And again, we are all incredibly vulnerable to this. Apologies to vegetarians. But everybody in this room, if you were going to buy a steak, would buy the one that says 80% lean. It's no different, but the way that number is presented compared to 20% compared to fat means that you will choose that one. Lean is good, fat is bad. Let's go a little bit more numeric. Um, I don't know how many numbery people I've got in the audience. I'm guessing there's some of them. 
the school's got economics in the title, so we're going to uh, confidently go ahead with a little bit of probability and hope not to um, hurt or offend anybody. So, um, good again, and there's a thousand pounds on the table. So you can play the game, you may or may not win a thousand pounds. And there's a number of ways I could do this. I could give you a thousand pounds, bet with probability one, you're definitely going to get it 100%. And the value of that game is a thousand pounds, because if you play it, you're going to win a thousand pounds. I could give you probability of 50% of winning a thousand pounds. In this case, if you played the game over and over, about half the time you would win a thousand pounds and half the time you wouldn't win it. So the value of any one game is the average of that is 500 pounds. You'll never win 500 pounds, but it's sort of even Stevens between zero and a thousand. So we'll, we call that the expected value. And as again, you go down the table, a quarter, one in four games to win a thousand pounds, that's worth about 250, down to one in 500 to two quid. Lovely, maths. People will have a preference would you rather pay £500 for a half chance to win £1,000 or pay £2 for a 1 in 500 chance to win £1,000? You'll have a preference, mathematically, it's sort of neither here nor there. In, e in each case, you know, you you you're doing quite well. But actually, in terms of my pocket, I do not want to lose £500, even if I've got a half chance of winning £1,000. Whereas I'm probably willing to lose more than two pounds for a decent shot at a thousand pounds because two pounds doesn't matter to me all that much. Um, so if I then frame the problem like this, and I was to say to you, okay, I've got a new game. I can you can have a guaranteed pound, hundred percent probability of having this pound, or you can have a one in ten chance at a tenner. I'm going to go out on a limb and say most people would go for a tenner the pound isn't that exciting we don't really need the pound we quite like a tenner go and have a drink lovely <clears throat> so statistics what if i said i'm going to guarantee you a million pounds or you can have a shot at 10 million pounds one in 10 chance if you're like me you're going to go for the million i would really like a million pounds that sounds great give it to me now but there's a couple of tricks in there one of them is that your decision will have been skewed by the word guaranteed so the way I framed this, what I've said to you is, you've you, you definitely got the million pounds. It's yours, you own it. If you were to then lose it, you would feel that you'd lost it. And humans are very loss aversive. People get only about half as much pleasure from winning a million pounds as they, as they feel pain from losing it. So it's very asymmetric when you make a bet. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is, if I was a multi-billionaire, all of a sudden, this is probably the bet I'm going to make. I don't need a million pounds anymore. I'm not going to notice that much. 10 million pounds will buy me a spare, like, smallish yacht, probably. So I'm going to go for that bet instead. So my perspective is quite skewed, depending on where I come from. So we've got the way that I've offered it to you and the word guaranteed versus the future possibility. I could have said, you have the option to win with 100% probability, but in the future, that million pounds, that might have changed your view a little bit. And then we've got the framing in terms of where I, where I am and how much money I've got to start with that makes a difference. And that tells us something I think is very interesting. There's a secret hidden number in here, and we call it the utility, and it measures how much value something has to me. So we've already seen there's a different value between what I have that I might lose and what is in the future that I might be able to gain. And there's also a perspective point, which says, you know, to me, a pound isn't worth all that much, I'm not that bothered about it, and a million pounds would be hugely valuable. There are other people to which a pound would be very valuable, and there are other people to it who wouldn't care about a million. So where you're standing starts to become very important, and that sounds obvious, but when we are working in policy and areas adjacent to politics, we have people who are in a field where they are very committed and believe that certain outcomes have very strong values. And that's true across the board. But when we're communicating our data and evidence to them, they're not starting from a level playing field. They're starting with a very strong set of prior beliefs and invested value in outcomes that may not be the same as ours. And that means it's very, very important to think about the way you frame to think about whether you're framing something as a loss or as a potential future, 
and to make sure that you're basically sitting down and thinking it all through before you go out with your dashboard and just throw numbers at people because it can go very badly wrong. One last thing along these points. Um, we'll do a quick, we're going to, this is the first and only thing where you'll be asked to directly comment. Um, it's just an example again of numbers. This is Tom's school, beautiful, lovely. It specializes only two subjects, history and chemistry. And I've chosen those subjects because they're roughly gender equal and just let's assume they're gender equal anyway. Uh, and it's about 78% of people are doing history and 20% of the people are doing chemistry. So here's Tom. I'm going to tell you about Tom. He's organized, he's very detail oriented, he's competent, he's quite self centered, and he scored far above average on his maths SATS exam. So I'm going to ask you to raise a hand if you think, and it's going to be a reminder you chemistry or history. Raise a hand if you think Tom is studying history. Raise a hand if you think Tom is studying chemistry. So we've got a lot more chemists. Let me remind you the only thing we know for sure. What percentage of the students are studying chemistry? About one in five. If you've got a guess and you know nothing else, yeah, it's a bit of a correlation with science and like math stats. But a lot of historians have got good math stats, and you probably don't know the number off the top of your head of what that correlation is. The thing we know is that only a fifth of students are studying chemistry. So the rational thing to do is to raise your hand in history because three, four out of five students in that school are studying history. But we had a stereotype in our heads, and that told us if he's good at maths, he's maybe not the most charming guy, but self-centered. <laughs> Probably a scientist like me. There you go. Um, that's called base rate neglect. And it's our tendency to give a lot more attention to event-specific information. I'll be clear now, this happens to all of us, very much myself included. We're distracted by the details and we forget the base rate. And we, we saw this a lot in COVID. You know, the levels of fear that people had, and it was very appropriate to have levels of fear, don't get me wrong, but people didn't necessarily always do a good job of thinking, in my area, in my population, you know, are we at a high base rate where one in every 50 people that I'm walking past has COVID? Or are we at a low base rate when almost nobody does? And that would meaningfully be expected to change your behaviour, but often didn't. So assumptions and stereotypes, they play really heavily into base rate neglect. And again, when you're all going out and presenting your evidence to people, you need to be very clear on the baselines that should be in that information that you should draw people's attention to before you start getting them, you know, the little specifics that actually only skew the outcome a little bit compared to the state of the world, which is the base rate and the number of students that are in the first bin to start with. So what can you do about it? It's actually quite, it's quite difficult. Um, we have to think very, very hard about the way we get our information. Yeah. Once we've got it, which is frankly the easy part of the time, the way you present it is crucial if what you're trying to do is get to a better outcome. And you know, the better outcome is better decisions with you know, better results. So good data and information underpins good decisions, but just having some numbers is not doing a good enough job. The presentation is absolutely crucial. So evidence-based decision-making and evidence-based communication are two things that as a data scientist, I really need to get a grip on. I should not just be going, good, I can code in Python, I can build a machine learning model, I can handle big data, you know, I can build cloud infrastructure, I'm good to go. When we're doing this, here's a quick list. So next time you're gonna go and talk to somebody about your information, any evidence of any sort, what do I know? What can I find out? Crucially, what don't I know? Or what do I think I know that I'm not very certain of? And we better find out how uncertain we are. What biases am I operating under? Am I anchoring? Am I overconfident? I definitely am. I've got a whole talk on that. Um, what biases and preferences are my audience operating under? They may well be very different to mine. I need to be able to put myself in their shoes and understand what they're expecting to see. Showing people something that they are not expecting to see or the opposite of what they're expecting to see and then going, here it is. It's a great way to disengage your audience. You have to think of a, an explanation for people. You have to say, well, you know, understand that you're expecting to see this. You know, we've actually found this, but, you know, it's very rational to have thought that. 
And here's the pathway that we've used to discover it's in fact this other thing. You need to take people on a journey, otherwise they're going to disengage from your information. How can I set up my decisions for success in terms of my framing, the way I talk people through the problem, what I'm telling them, what the backgrounds are. So basically the way we present the information is hugely, hugely important. And at this point, I'm going to, this is relatively short, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my job. And, uh, and then anyone who wants to talk more about the evidence around communication, we can do that afterwards. But what do we want, evidence-based policy? Yes, we do. Um, I have a remit, improve the use of evidence in government decision-making. Um, I wrote it. Um, so I arrived in September, 2020. Uh, sort of with, with, with a new team. There are a few people in the building that were sort of starting before I got there. It was very small, so about four people. And we really wanted to change the way that government was using evidence. And it's not really something that I think had been in the works for a long time. As with many things, COVID happened and people realised they were missing a trick. And that happened in businesses, companies, probably universities. And, and of course, in government and government related agencies. And it became apparent that actually having data on tap, information on tap, and people that knew how to go and get it really quickly and you know, make it accessible was very, very important. So I joined and sort of I, I, I went in and I, I said to my new, new boss, What would you like me to do? And he said, oh, I have no idea. Um, so this is the environment we were sort of starting in. And we started in a place where we were not part of the furniture. It wasn't something that was ready to go. People weren't necessarily across the board going to welcome us with open arms, bunch of nerds with a load of data. So we started out in what I'd call innovation by exception. You're picking a few areas and trying to get in with your new ideas. And we needed to move into what we call innovation by design. So where the things that we're doing are part of the machinery and it's expected that you're going to be doing data dashboards, evidence as part of that decision-making process in a formal way. So that's actually quite difficult to do. And one of the reasons why is about expertise and confidence. I just find this very interesting. So I'm going to segue and talk about it briefly. Um, we're all really, really confident. And again, when we go into somewhere like government, and, and you'll find that you've got policy officials who've been working for a long time in space, and they know they know their stuff. They're confident. I know my stuff. I know about technology and data, and I'm I'm very confident as well. Turns out that's not always very helpful, um, and we struggle to believe it's not very helpful. So there's this very interesting Tetlock study that hopefully a lot of you have seen, but if not, Philip Tetlock went and found 284 political experts, and he got them to make 100 predictions. And the predictions are not particularly complex, so you know, this thing that currently exists, is it going to get bigger over 20 years? Is it going to get you know, smaller or less? Or is it going to sort of stay roughly the same was kind of the, the questions he was asking. Uh, 100, 100 different sort of subject areas, make a prediction about what will happen in the future. And a prediction, let's not forget, it is a decision. You take the information that you've got and you decide, will it go up, down, or you make that prediction. And um, it was quite a possibly quite an antagonistic paper in which he sort of pointed out that the experts did about as well as monkeys throwing darts at the dartboard in terms of their political predictions. And there were a few interesting points. It was slightly better than random, but it was much less good than what we call a minimally sophisticated statistical model, which is pretty much just take what it's doing now, average it and lobby it. Um, people are better outside their field than in. So if you were predicting you know, in education and you're an economist, you might do better than you did in economics, which is probably surprising. Teams did better than individuals, which is a great clue in how to make better decisions, build diverse teams. But the participants were very highly confident they were going to be right. And they were surprised when they weren't right. And in fact, he had some commentary on the human sort of lack of ability to adjust to being wrong. And we do this all the time. Um, we sort of will say, well, I was nearly right. If only this thing hadn't happened, I would have been correct. Um, and I'm, we, we all do this all the time. I, I'm chronically just a little bit late. I've got better over time, but I find it very hard to be early for things. And I'm always surprised when I'm just a tiny bit late. And I've always got an excuse. I'll be, well, you know, there was a tractor in front of me. I'd, you couldn't predict it if the tractor hadn't been there. I live in the middle of the countryside. It's just not that improbable. 
but mentally we make excuses for ourselves we don't really take accountability and that's true of absolutely everybody and we need to practice to get good at that so our political experts will be not targeting any individuals but like every other human they will believe that they're right because they have expertise when they find out that they're not right they will build a mental model that excuses that and you know there's a good reason i was nearly right i just you know if there's other unexpected things have happened and they will fail to recognize when they're wrong and i do it and you do it this is what it means to be human and it's definitely not just sort of political and policy areas technologist predictions have been measured to be about 80 to 80 percent wrong most of the time and when you go and query fund managers and you ask them do you perform you know better than average worse than average on our, on average uh, 74 percent of them say that they're doing less than average all the rest will say i'm doing at least average which is not how averages work so we know that people are very bad at predicting the field, future or making decisions in their area of work and um we tend to overestimate how good we are at all times so you're going into an area with people who know much like everybody else that they've got an area of expertise and they don't necessarily think that what they need is a data person to pitch up with numbers um because they already know what they're doing so you've got to find a way to argue the round of thinking that perhaps they would like to look at those numbers and talk about them a bit more and that you might if you do that change their minds on something so we built this team 10 ds 10 data science we spend as i mentioned about 80 percent of the time on evidence-based decisions the rest of the time we try and what, what we call build a better customer. So we're trying to teach the civil service and the people that we work with to be better at making decisions. So we don't have to be there all the time to ask the right questions, to interact with data in a slightly more knowledgeable way. And it's an old system and it's not usually built into their training, although we're still trying to change that. So trying to change the way people ask questions and respond to data. And then finally, with our little bit of extra time, we do something called targeted interventions, which is where you pick something and try and change it. And I'll talk very briefly about these things and then go to questions. So the evidence-based decisions. We're going to get some evidence and data. We're going to figure out what we're uncertain about. We're probably going to try and do some predictive modeling, as I mentioned before. If you choose these combination of policy options, we think this will happen. And we've got some idea of how confident we are of that. And that allows people to explore the evidence space and all of the options they've got, and then to see what comes out of it. And of course, we're going to try and communicate that data really effectively in a way that empowers them to make the decision and doesn't make the decision for them because it's not our job. We're in number 10. The turnaround time in my team for a new dashboard is usually between about one and six days. So from question to answer very quickly, most of the time because decisions are not slow. A decision is going to come in, you're going to have to make a choice and you have quite a short period of time in which you can impact what's going to happen. So we can't get it exactly right. We have to be really good at doing the absolute best job we can. And again, saying that here's what we don't know. You know, we, we have to do better than nothing. And we do very, very well actually, but you know, you can't stop and wait for it to be perfect or you will never get there. So we have to be very fast and we do our absolute best and we make sure our best is good. So that's what we're doing in that space. We're building a better customer. Show not tell is very important. People don't want to be told what to do. You can go in and show them. You say, here is my interactive visualization. Have a look at it and see what the future looks like. You know, if you do these things. Um, we also were quite high tech. So they're quite flashy, if I'm honest with you. They're, you know, you, 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 they're, they're shiny. There's lovely navig navigatable maps and, you know, uh, sort of stock flow diagrams that might move that kind of thing. We want people to look at them and go, oh, it's nice. Um, partly so they want to use them if they're kind of internally. Also, because uh, what we find is that often other departments don't yet have this level of capability. And we want their ministers and their permanent secretaries to go back to their own departments to go, going to have to get one of those. I want to hire more people like me because it makes my job a lot easier if departments are doing all their own work in this space. And then, of course, as we are showing them the dashboards, we're really talking them through in a way that we hope will teach them the questions to ask next time, that were really informative, that will, that will sort of teach the data skills, not just give them the answers. 
So every time we present a dashboard, we're going to try and give people information on how to do this themselves. So that if we're not there, then you know they're still going to make really great decisions. So that's a big part of the job and it's built into everything we do. And then finally, the targeted interventions. And this is about changing government. And I have a team of now 25, which is very big for Downing Street. It's one of the biggest teams. And uh, we therefore don't have loads of resource. We're pretty busy. So what can we do to genuinely change with our small number of people the way that government works? I'll give you a few examples of things that we've done. So um, I'm going to make a set of decisions when I do this. We've maybe got like 15% of time left at this point. And I go through a checklist. And I say, you know, got an idea. First of all, do I think it's important? Do I think it's good? I want to spend as little time as possible on things that are not important or that I don't think are for the greater good. Does it get me closer to my goal? Improving the use of evidence in government decision making. So it could be really good, but not, you know, not do that, in which case it's maybe somebody else's problem. Does it match my risk profile? And does it have side benefits? And I like to tell people this because I think it's a really great way to improve your decision making. So um, civil service particularly is quite risk averse. It's not really an environment where people are encouraged to take sort of managed risks. And when they do it, they may or may not sort of do it well. So I deliberately have a sort of percentage risk target where I'm saying I want to fail maybe 20% of the time. You know? Because if you're never ever failing, you're not really trying, right? We have to fail really well when we do it. We have to fail very quickly. I don't want to spend three months failing, I want to spend two or three days, but you know, we're going to actually shoot for the stars on this, we're going to try really hard things. But if I'm going to try hard things and fail, I need an upside. I really don't like to waste my time, I don't have a lot of time, I'm very busy, and I can't be throwing away 20-30% of my time on things that are going to fall over. So I will only do something like this if I've got good side benefits, and those side benefits might be, I'm going to write some code that's reusable, good for something else. We're going to build a great relationship with a department that we're struggling with at the moment. We can do do them favor, and that will help us next time. Uh, it's going to be really exciting. You know, we've done some things with some sort of secret military organisations, and it's it's very exciting for the staff, and therefore helps my retention. They're doing something really interesting. So there's lots of ways that the things that you do, other than the main outcome, can be really worth doing. But that has to be part of the decision-making process. And I really recommend it to you when you're deciding what to do with your lives. And then finally, what's the opportunity cost? If I didn't do this, is there something even better I could be doing? Once you've crossed those kind of checklist hurdles, see if I'm going to do something or not, then we're going to pick a certain amount of time and go and do something. So here's an example. One of the first things I did when I joined government, and I came from medical technology, so I'd spent 10 years running a startup, sort of startup to SME to acquisition. I did a lot of work integrating with the NHS, so building APIs, which are sort of data sharing code. And uh, I just looked around government and thought, well, we're really struggling to share data here. There's no central infrastructure. There's not a, like a, a recognized way to do this. So what was happening is that departments would sort of not share their data for a really long time. And then, they, then they'd have to, and at some point they'd probably panic and hire a consultancy company of vast sums of money to go and build these very simple sort of data systems that, that you know, data engineers and developers could do really quite quickly. So, um, and we, did, we didn't have a department that was responsible for that as well. You know, the government digital service delivers digital services mostly out to the public, but not data infrastructure. And, you know, we have a sort of, there's a sort of data and digital policy unit, but they're not, they're not building things. So I went, right, we're, we're, we're gonna build it. So, you know, we built this API and we put it on GitHub, it's free to the public. Anyone can use it. We've rolled it out into 12 departments and we spent very little money on it, just sort of the time spent to build it. So all of a sudden you've got a free data sharing system for government. So I was very pleased with how that went actually. And that encouraged me to kick off this kind of target intervention program and do it a bit more. We went through the innovation fellowships, trying to bring in external experts into government. And then in, uh, there's a few other bits and pieces. And then in January this year, my favorite thing out of the evidence house was sort of the culmination of, of uh, about point two and a quarter years of effort. And um, we'd already had quite a lot of success in solving government problems with hackathons. So, you know, first year or so building up the product, probably second year building up our reputation, building up some relationships. At this point, we wanted to solve bigger problems. You can't go to 25 people who are full-time employed and very, very busy 
And so we started running hackathons and we would say, you know, hey, data enthusiasts, got a problem to solve, come and help us. And we'd all sit in a room for a couple of days and hack our way through, you know, here's some data. Let's try and build a solution. And what you'd end up doing was that you'd get, you know, some really good insights from the data scientists and analysts that would pitch up and try and help them. Uh, but what I noticed is they didn't really go anywhere. So, you know, after two days, you might have a bunch of presentations. We learned this about, you know, the way that people flow through prisons and how to stop them having to flow through prisons, et cetera. But it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't probably go anywhere because the people in the department are also busy and they maybe don't have the right skills to turn that into a product or something that actually changes the outcomes. So thought we're going to have to do better than that. And we decided to launch Evidence House back in January. And what we do now is we do what we call radical upskilling. It's free. And people will step in and teach. And you'll come along, you'll learn to code. We did one two, two weeks ago at a conference. Everyone brought their laptops, 500 odd people. Either in beginner track, they were maybe already an analyst, but they didn't know how to code. We taught them Python. Through to more expert people who we asked AWS to come in, taught them cloud infrastructure design. Uh, you know, they built AI chatbots. And when they finish, they're, they're ready to go. So we've got a lot more people who can do this now. And then when we do our hackathons, what happens is the winning products, they get turned into a real product. We, we bring these people in, we upskill, we get them in for a comment, and we turn it into something that's deployed. So if you happen to be read, reading the news, Oliver Dowden uh, announced uh, probably a month or so ago that he was using uh, AI-generated red box, the ministerial red box. That came out of one of our hackathons. We then invited some of the winners to come in and work with our team, and they built it into something that you could deploy into ministerial offices. And it reads all the ministerial submissions, does the obvious thing, summarizes them, etc. It will also go back through the minister's history. So everything he's seen before, perhaps what he's had opinions on before, has he given a speech? We all have a bit of a guess at what the minister's likely to think of the submission. So it's great fun. Um, but we're doing this for much more serious things as well. You know, there's been a big piece of work on maternal and infant outcomes, um, damage to mothers and babies and childcare is one of the leading costs in the NHS and is of course a bad thing when using large language models to read in student reports and kind of try and find ways to intervene on that. We try and get people to their accommodation more effectively and save money in the asylum process, all those sorts of things. Um, and we try and build lots of efficiency tools that help us to do things better in the civil service. But I've been very proud of this because in total, up until two weeks ago, we'd only spent 500 pounds. I've spent a little bit more for a conference venue but um, we've trained about 1,200 people to come through code, do data better. Next time there's a COVID, we can go and find them and ask them to come and help, and they'll be sort of ready, ready and waiting. And what's really interesting is the sheer levels of enthusiasm. People rush to this program and come and train and come and join us. And that leads us to where we are now. It's been going so well that we've now got a new incubator for AI. We're hiring an extra 20 proper AI experts to come in and build out these sorts of you know, solutions for us and with us. And uh, that's what I'm doing this month. So if you've got any AI specialism, come and apply for a job with us and come and build out solutions to big, frightening problems. Um, so I'm recruiting right now, which is why I've thrown that in at the end. Thank you very much. That was all I wanted to talk to you about. Um, and I think I'll come and sit next to you. Thanks, Laura. Well, Laura, thanks.